Good morning. It's great to see you all. And those that I can't see, but you're looking at us, glad that you're participating in the service today. We're in a series about our vision and our values. Uh, on maps, you often see something that says, you are here, and then there's a, a point. You are here. And uh, I think there's a really good statement to think about why you are here. It's good to know where you are. It's also good to know why you are where you are. And we're here for vision. We're here for mission. We want to live out values. And so this morning, we're going to, we're going to talk about the value of hospitality. And we're going to begin in the book of uh, Genesis. So if you have your copy of scriptures, whether it's an electronic uh, or a, a physical copy, analog copy, or it, I don't know if you're aware of this, but when you walk in our auditorium, there's bookcases on either side in the back that have copies of scripture, and you can bring one of those with you to your seat if you'd want them. But in the very first book of the Bible, so it's easy to find, chapter 18, beginning in verse 1, it says, The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre. And while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day, Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. And when he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them. And he bowed low to the ground. And he said, if I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me also, um, let me get you something to eat so that you can be refreshed and then go on your way now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they said, do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quickly, he said, get three seahs of the finest flour. By the way, that's a lot of flour. That's not just a loaf of bread. It's enough flour for them to be able to make bread for the meal and then each of those three men to have a week's supply of bread while they traveled. Yeah, it's, it's, he, it, this was a big order. <laughs> uh, the finest flour, knead it, bake some bread. Then he ran to the... Uh, to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to the servant who hurried to prepare it. And then he brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared, set those before them. And while, there, while they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Where's your wife, Sarah? They asked him. There in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, We'll have a son. Uh, our, our mission is to create a safe place for people to find faith and to find friends and to find their future. And we've talked about that the last three weeks. But what are the guidelines or the guard rules uh, that, that help us do that in a healthy way? Because you can get so focused on a mission that the ends justifies the means and you can do things in unhealthy ways. So what we want to do is we want to have a set of guidelines that help us honor the vision of the house, the mission of the house, in a way that also honors God. And we just think that if God values something, we should value something. So at Calvary Assembly, because everyone is important to God, everyone is welcome here. I want you to hear that again. Is that, is that not a good thing? Because everyone is important to God, everyone is welcome here. Now, I'd like to talk about something that I don't usually hear discussed, and it might make you a little uncomfortable. And uh, it's okay, it will get better as we go along. But a lot of people don't talk about the problems that hospitality produces. Hospitality can be challenging. Hospitality can be expensive. Like how should we think about this? The majority, for example, there's the problem of personality. Some people think that you have to be a really outgoing person. You have to have basically no inhibitions in order to be an hospitable person. And so most people, by, by majority, like more people are introverted than extroverted in our world. And so when we think about hospitality, we go, yeah, that's, that's not for me. I'm not one of those people who just march boldly into the presence of unknown others and, and start conversations. And, and here's what I want you to know. You don't have to be uninhibited to be welcoming. 
You don't have to be the life of the party to help welcome other people to the party. All right? We're not asking you to be on stage. But there's a way that we can welcome people. Then there's the problem of offense. How many have ever offended someone without trying? Yeah. <laughs> let, me, let me see this. How many offended someone by trying? I'm just curious. Yeah, that's what I thought. There's a couple of you around. <laughs> uh, so without trying, and how does that happen? Because usually there's something we don't know about the person. You can say or do something that winds up being offensive. When, when I go to other countries where the cultures are very different, the first thing I say before I say anything else in my speaking, I tell them, it's entirely possible that I will say or do something today that is offensive to you because of my ignorance. I don't know. And one of the gifts you can give me is to let me know when I do that so I don't do it again. We just don't know. Um, if you don't know something about someone, it's easier to ask questions than it is just to make statements. Questions are a great way to start conversations. I will say this, don't talk politics. Calvary Assembly is a politics-free zone. But pastor, you don't know how important the issues are. Yes, I do. And I've made a decision. Jesus is more important than those. What do you think? Think so? I've made another decision. His agenda is more important than a political party's agenda. What do you think? Yeah. So when we come together, we don't, we don't look to, to see if we can convince anybody. By the way, just think about it. How many people have you actually convinced about your political persuasion? It's terrible. It's, it's terrible the, 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 the rate of which you can bring people over to your side politically. And uh, when most people are making political statements, what they're really looking for is people who think like them. And then they'd like everyone who doesn't think like them to take a step back and go someplace else. True? Yeah. Well, it's, it is true. So don't talk politics because politics divides us right now. There may have been times when people could have political conversations and it didn't divide, divide them. That's not where our culture is right now. And then there's the problem of awkwardness. Uh, how many here have ever put your foot in your mouth? It leaves a bad taste, doesn't it? I hate when I do that. And, and so we can, we can feel a little awkward when we're interacting with someone that we do not know. If you know someone, it's, it's very easy to just invite them to sit next to you. But how do you invite someone to sit ne next to you that you don't know? And here's what I want you to know about hospitality. Hospitality understands the guest already feels awkward, and I'm willing to enter some awkwardness to take the awkwardness away from them. That's how that works. You see, in the Bible, hospitality is primarily the love of strangers. Think about that. Hospitality in the Bible primarily is the love of strangers. In Hebrews, the 13th chapter, it says, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. The Greek word for that is Philadelphia. If you didn't know, that's what that word means. Uh, the, the city in our country that's named Philadelphia, it's, it's no, well, the title is the city of brotherly love. I don't know if they've always lived up to that, but that's the title, okay? Uh, Philadelphia. The, the word for hospitality is, is philo, so it starts with Philadelphia, but then it's xeno. Uh, we get the word xenophobia, uh, xeno, uh, others, fear, fear of others. And what the Bible says, love of strangers. Not fear of strangers, love of strangers. The problem of fear is a very real thing. Our culture has become increasingly suspicious of people who are not like us. Social media has this capacity to remove people who are not like us from our interactions. And then people who are like us define people who are not in the conversation. And the problem is we don't like that when it happens to us. 
But that's what social media does. Social media often defines people you've never had an interaction with and you become concerned about or fearful of. <clears throat> we've learned to fear the very worst in others. And we've learned to fear the disapproval of people that we do like if we hang around people that we don't like. So people start questioning our motives, or I, I, I thought you were part of our group. That's a real problem. And then there's the problem of cost. Hospitality has an expense associated with it. The, the primary expense is time and energy. If you want to be hospitable, you actually want to spend a little time doing that. You, you can't really do drive-by hospitality. You know, uh, one of the things that we do is, is donuts and bagels and all kinds of goodies and coffee. How many noticed on the way in? If, I, it's hard to miss. <laughs> and you come in. And, and so we don't just drive down the street and throw donuts out the, out the window of a car and, and call that hospitality. Like, we, we want to take the time. So there's, there's time and there's energy. And there is some cost. You might be very surprised to discover that because we give those donuts and bagels away does not mean that they are given to us. We, we pay for those. I, I had a, a pastor friend, when he came here, he saw all those donuts. And his first question was, how much do those cost? And I said, well, more than you think. <laughs> and he was offended. How can you pay that much for donuts? I said, we're not paying for donuts. We're paying for fellowship. It's amazing when there's something as simple as a styrofoam cup and a, and a donut or a bagel. or We do have some healthier options, but advertising those doesn't seem to attract anyone. <laughs> so I don't know why. But anyways, uh, uh, that can be an incredible reason to enter a conversation. And that's really what hospitality is about. In the ancient world, they were far more sophisticated about hospitality than we are. Like when we think about our access to technology, I, I have more technology in my pocket than, than anyone in the ancient world had available to them. And we can often assume that maybe they were not as intelligent. Intelligence is not determined by your access to technology. They were quite intelligent. And in fact, they would look at us as like a third world nation when it comes to hospitality. Modern culture is horrible at it. We're not good. And even when we think we're, we're doing it right, we're actually doing something other than hospitality. Um, there's, there's no way, that, the reason hospitality was so important is that there's no real way to carry everything you need to get where you're going if you traveled in the ancient world. They didn't have the same kind of economic systems that you and I had. So if, if you were gonna take a long journey, there had better be some places you could stop where people would help take care of you or you're going to be in real trouble real fast. You'd have, to, you'd have to be incredibly rich to travel, but that's not how it worked in the ancient world. They created this system called hospitality. Abraham was a wealthy person, but he also knew the value of hospitality. He had traveled most of his life and had benefited from the hospitality of others. And he wanted to be a person who was hospitable to those who were around him. So when Abraham in our chapter that we looked at in Genesis looks up, he sees three people he doesn't know. He's never seen them before. And what he does, what he doesn't do, he doesn't run into his tent and hide. You know, um, I don't know if, if you ever do this, but when I'm on vacation, uh, uh, my wife and I have a rule, and that is make no eye contact with people. I, I don't know if you have that, and I don't know if you think less of me for having that, but when we go on vacation, uh, we just kind of do this a lot. It was just, and uh, we were on vacation somewhere, and, and once people find out what I do for a living, they start conversations. Uh, and, and so some of them has to do with maybe the churches that they serve in, and some of them has to do with, with uh, people that they know who are in ministry. And, and so those conversations can get a little bit prolonged. And, and then once you've established that relationship, every time they see you after that, you're going to have another conversation. So we, we do a lot of this. And I, I, was on, I was on vacation, and, and a guy came up to me. We, we were doing a little event with a group, and a guy came up to me, and, and it's so American. What do you do? You know, in, in other countries of the world, they don't ask that question. 
They want to know where you come from. They want to know about your family. They, they want to know about many other things. The Americans always want to, what, what is it you do exactly? And what do you do? And I, I just looked at them. I, I, I saw the, the look on my wife of apprehensions. And, and so I just looked at them and I said, well, if I tell you that, uh, my vacation is going to turn sour really fast. And so we're going to keep that a secret. And, and he just, he kept his distance from me, but he kept his eye on me the rest of the event. It's just, <laughs> it's really interesting. Abraham doesn't run back in his tent. And he doesn't just start doing something else to prove he's busy, busy so he doesn't have to interact with people. He hurried to meet them. And he bows low to the ground because in that culture, that's how you showed honor. In lots of cultures in the world where bowing is the way you greet, which when you think about it is, is probably more hygienic than the way we greet. But when you bow, the deal was you always bow lower than their head. And the lower you bow, the more prominent you, you are saying they are as a person. So he bows low to the ground. What is he saying? You are important to me. And then he invited them, you are welcome here. And then he offered to provide water so they could wash their feet. He's saying, I want to serve you. And then he offered food to help refresh them. What he's saying is, I want you to feel refreshed. Just think about this. Wouldn't it be incredible if our church was known as a church family, a faith community, that when people come in, we say, you are important to me. You are welcome here. I want to serve you. I want you to feel refreshed when you leave. How many think that would be an incredible, an incredible thing to be able to communicate to our community? Yeah, it is. That's a picture of hospitality in the ancient world. It was a way to share. And then through conversation, you would also learn lots of things. They, they didn't have access to all the technology that we do, so they would hear stories about what was going on in faraway places, and, and they could, would develop connections with people that they had not met before. But primarily, it was a way for them to say, you are important to me. Now, in case you're wondering, there were also rules for guests. There were rules for people being hospitable, but there were rules for guests. There was a two-night maximum rule. If, you, if somebody invited you to their home, you didn't stay longer than two nights. You didn't just camp out until they ran out of food or kicked you out. Like That was the maximum that you would do. And most people were going somewhere. Like They had to get where they were going. They just needed a place to stay for the night. There wasn't a lot of hotels and things like that to be able to stay in. So there were rules. If, but th this is another rule. If you were going to accept hospitality, you had to be committed to being an hospitable person. So at Calvary Assembly, because everyone is important to God, everyone is welcome here. Everyone. The goal that we have is to share what we have, not show off what we have. That's a big distinction. See, in our culture, what we, what we think is entertainment is hospitality. And so, has anyone ever heard of a woman by the name of Martha Stewart? She's a, she's a remarkable lady. She really is. She, I mean, if you ever get invited to dinner at, at her house, you're going to go, right? You just are. You're going to, you'll, you'll cancel whatever else it is. Like, like Bill's Super Bowl, Martha Stewart. Well, I know what I would do, but a lot of other people would choose the Martha Stewart thing. And and everything is so perfect. I mean, it's just amazing. And everything tastes so wonderful. And, and, and everything is so attractive. And everything is so thoughtful. It's just so impressive. And, and people walk away from that. And they go, man, that Martha Stewart, she is a phenomenal host. She puts on a great dinner party. What a great person. That is entertainment. Entertainment has a value. I'm not suggesting that it doesn't. But that's not hospitality. Hospitality is focused on the guest, not the host. 
When someone comes in here, we're not just showing off, oh, look at our place. Oh, listen to our music. Oh, listen to our message. And when you walk out, you know, we all hope you go, oh, that's a great facility. That's a great pastor. That's a great worship band. Boy, what a great people they are. No, I want our focus to be on the guests so that when they're leaving, I do want the music to be good. I do want the preaching to be good. I do want the facility to be nice. But what I want their primary impression to be, they were so welcoming of me. I feel welcome here. That is hospitality. Entertainment calls attention to the host. Hospitality pays attention to the guest. So one of our values is hospitality. And here's the challenge. Say, well, I don't know them well enough to trust them. Here's the beautiful thing. You don't have to trust someone to be hospitable. Isn't that nice? Trust is built over time. Hospitality demonstrates graciousness and generosity without requiring a relationship first. You can actually be nice to someone without knowing them. What do you think? It's a revolutionary idea, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah. See, our world is not going to be changed by showing off. Our world will not be changed for the better by acting or failing to act based on our fears. Our world is not going to be changed for the better by requiring others to prove themselves to us before we're willing to welcome them or share what we have with them. Hospitality helps bring change to our world, but maybe not the way you think. So let's talk for a couple minutes now about the possibilities. Those are the problems of, of hospitality. What are the possibilities? And in the early church, they had a reputation for hospitality. That's one of the reasons that the early church was so effective in reaching their community. They just kept inviting people into their home. And here's the thing about hospitality, is that we, we don't think that hospitality is just something we do on Sunday when we come to worship. We practice it here, so we're able to do it wherever we go. You can be hospitable in places other than church or religious environments. Hospitality is the expression of love and acceptance. And that has an incredible influence on people. So the first thing I'd like to mention is that the possibility is that God likes to share with people who like to share. One of the first conversations God has with Abraham is back in Genesis 12, and this is what he says. He says, I will bless you, and you will be a blessing to the world. What is he saying? I know if I give a lot to you, you're going to give a lot away. I know you're going to share what you have because Abraham was a person of hospitality. By the way, I, I wanted to let you guys know, if you hadn't heard yet, the contributions that you made for the emergency situation, emergency situation in Haiti, I mean, we weren't the only church, obviously, that was participating in that. Lots of people contributed. But I just got word back from one of the organizations that we supported, and they have been able to provide relief for 7,000 families, but not stopping there. They're also providing rebuilding for 7,000 families, which means they've met the immediate need and they're making sure they have a place to stay. Isn't that great? When we do things like that, we have every right to believe that God's going to continue to bless us because when he blesses us, we bless others. How many think that's how it should be? That, that's a really good thing, right? That's how it should be. So God likes to share with people who like to share. Uh, so the Lord and two angels are actually traveling and they're incognito. There's no indication that they're anything other than ordinary people that, that Abraham doesn't know. Just three ordinary strangers and Abraham welcomes them immediately. And the question I've often thought about, what if Abraham found something else to do right then? Oh, the, the tents in a mess. <laughs> Food for three more people. That's a lot. I, seems like a lot. In that conversation, the angel tells Abraham, I'm coming back next year, and by that time, your wife, Sarah, is going to have a son. And this is a stranger talking. Now, it's not really, but the Lord and the angels are incognito. And as a result of Abraham's hospitality, 
he's going to experience an answer to prayer. That's a very powerful thing. You know, we built this place so we would have space to welcome others. When guests show up, that's actually an answer to prayer. It might surprise you, we didn't pray for money. We didn't. We prayed for guests, and then we made provision for when the guests come. Why did we do that? Because hospitality is important to us. Not only is there answered prayer, but there's new life. I mean, a year later, there's going to be a cry in a tent of a new baby born into this world who will carry on the mantle of also being a blessing to the world. Welcoming a person into our environment doesn't mean they automatically have new spiritual life. I wish it was that easy, but it's not actually how it works. Only God can give someone new spiritual life. But when we welcome God and we welcome others, we think that we create an environment where new life is possible. We think that's a really big deal. So. We think that new life is an option and vision becomes reality. The vision of this house isn't a room full of people. That might surprise you. The vision of Calvary Assembly is not this place packed to capacity more than one time on Sunday. The vision of this house is people full of God's grace and God's power so that everywhere they go, they are also bringing the kingdom of God with them into the places and to the people who need it the most. Yeah, I think that's a good place to thank God for the vision of this house. The reason we want to grow is not to brag about how many people came here on Sunday. In fact, you'd be hard pressed to find examples of us bragging about attendance here. We desire to invest in people so that they can carry the grace and the power of God every single place that they go. I'm gonna ask the worship team to come up, but here are five ways, five ways that you can help be part of a culture of hospitality and welcome guests here. And, and these things are actually quite simple. They're not hard. These are not complicated things. Uh, the, what makes it challenging is that either we forget or we think it's, it's so simple, it probably is not as effective as I thought. So here's some things you could do. Number one, smile more. Why don't you practice, all right? Just put your best smile on, look at the person next to you, and then ask them, how did I do? Just go ahead and try it and, and see what they say, all right? And, and I know what some of you are saying. You're saying, Pastor, I got a mask on. They can't see my smile. Yes, they can. You can tell a person is smiling just by how their eyes look. It's true. So smile more. Everyone can smile more. It takes more muscles to frown than it does to smile. And some of us need to give our face a rest. Just <laughs> smile. Here's another thing. Easy to do. Slide over. Slide over. What do I mean by that? When guests come in, they're looking to be able to sit on the end of a row. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, wait, that's the best seat. Yes, you are right. In a church, the best seats are on the ends of rows and in the back. I don't ever have to train people to sit in the back of a church. <laughs> they just gravitate there. It's scary. I've often threatened to take this pulpit and put it back there and see what happens. <laughs> Slide over. When you see someone you don't know, don't do this. Who are you? Don't, don't do that. Just say, hi, I'm Bob. Well, say your name. Don't say Bob. <laughs> and if they indicate this is their first time and they're sitting next to you, Become a go-to person for them. What do I mean by that? Give them inside information. When something's about to happen, you just kind of whisper, well, this is what happens now, or this is what will happen next. And, and by the way, one of the things you can do is, uh, you know, service is getting to a close. You can just look at them and say, I don't know if you have time, but if you do, I'd love you to meet some of our pastoral team. I'd, I'd love to introduce you. And at the end of almost every service, like, I'm back in the lobby and a number of our pastoral team is around and just introducing them because we're not just here to perform. We're here to pastor. There's a lot of difference between those two things. 
when we're about to do the offering. If they've told you this is their first time, say, this is where a, a container is going to come by and, and some people will be putting some money in and, and some people will be putting cards in. And, and if, you, if you have your card, you're welcome to put that in. But if this is your first time, you, you don't have to put anything in the offering today. This service is, is on us. We're so glad you're here. Then let them know, not just that we have coffee and donuts, but that they're free. Because some people don't assume that they're free. They keep looking for the price. And, and then there's, there's questions you can ask, you know, do you live in the area? Uh, the names of people who are with them today? Uh, how did you hear about this place? Like, how did you wind up being able to sit next to me today? That's a story worth hearing. If it's a beautiful day, what, what plans do you have to enjoy this day? If it's a lousy day, what plans did you have that got rained out today, you know? By the way, another thing you can do, fill out your own connection card. Oh, pastor, I don't have any updated information. You know who I am. Yes, but when you fill out yours, you give them permission to fill out theirs. And now we can connect with them. And by the way, before they get up and walk off, or you do, just look at them and say this. Thanks for sitting with me today. You would be surprised how powerful that is. Hospitality doesn't change people. Hospitality welcomes people. Jesus changes people. And this is what I know. Everyone who interacts with Jesus, their life is changed. So we don't just want to practice this here. We do want to practice this here, but we want to practice this everywhere we go. Heavenly Father, um, you've been so generous with us, and we're so grateful for the people in our lives who have shown something of a spirit of hospitality, and they, they invited us in, they made us feel welcome. For some of us, that's the difference between a life of faith and not. Would you help us to be people who live out the value of hospitality. We know everyone's important to you. Whoever comes into this place, we want them to know they are welcome here. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.